Hi, greetings everyone. I am Randy Morton, the host of this Marine Resources show, um, Sea Hunters, and we are here today with the director, Mr. Mark Williams, and the deputy director, Mr. E. Lemuel Pemberton. Welcome, gentlemen. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. We are happy to be, be here to uh, this inaugural show and we hope that this is a series of uh, a number of episodes that um, can go on for the benefit of uh, fisher folk and would be fisher folk in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, that was a quick introduction. Um, well, one question. Since 2019, the Department of Fisheries name has been changed to Marine Resources. Can you explain to us why that was done? Well, um, in the past, the Department of Fisheries only used to deal with uh, fish landings, uh, fish captured and uh, fish sold, fish exported. However, the, ex the mandate of the Department of Fisheries has expanded to more marine resources where we look at um, underwater cultural heritage, uh, fish aggregating device, marine management areas, um, the high seas fisheries. So um, the, since the, the mandate has expanded, it was wise to change the name so that persons don't think that um, we still de deal with the same old things as before. All right, well, Mr. Pemerton, um, as the deputy director of marine resources. Um, how do you feel that this change would affect fishers in Nevis? Well, this would mean that things are being standardized in terms of how we approach the industry. So in terms of the, let's say the fishing vessels, uh, we will have a register of fishing vessels that is basically common to sink it and Nevis. Although you will have those vessels that are unique to sink it and those that are unique to Nevis, we will have a system whereby almost instantly, by looking into the system, you will be able to identify those vessels which are from sink it and those from Nevis. And you know, in addition to that as well, there is more opportunity for training of persons in the industry, both from the uh, standpoint of the employees as well as employees of the Department of Marine Resources as well as the fishers. Because when you are looking at these opportunities, they should be, it should be done across both islands, St. Kitts and Nevis. So in those aspects, yes, uh, there might have been a little bit of, a, of change. Or previously, uh, things were a little bit different. At, even at one point in the 1990s, uh, we had a Department of Fisheries in Nevis, but in St. Kitts you still had a Fisheries Management Unit. And then St. Kitts also got a Department of Fisheries, as Mark said, and now it's a Department of Marine Resources, which includes both departments on St. Kitts and Nevis. And so it's basically a federal entity rather than just two island entities where you are having people sometimes working maybe even in opposition to each other, or even without the knowledge of uh, one, one the, uh, one entity not knowing what the other entity is doing but now it should be clear as to what is to be done by both entities all right thank you um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask another question um, but this one is along the line of fads because in recent time there's been quite a bit of conflict in relation to fads and who can fish what fad um, could you clarify the FAD situation for us, please? Well, f FADs were placed um, in the marine environment um, in great abundance in tw around 2012. We had looked at um, the fish aggregating device fishery as a fishery that could alleviate um, pressure of the near shore marine space where uh, we have some of our most sensitive ecosystems. Uh, what you have seen um, since 2012 is that uh, fishers have realized the economic benefits of fishing from the, the fads, where you can spend less time, um, catch, capture a, a greater amount of fish at, um, with less effort. Um, as a result, you see the, 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 the fad fishery um, develop um, exponentially. 
with that came a number of issues and one of the issues is ownership. We are, uh, fishers feel that um, if they put place a fad in the marine environment, they are entitled to that um, space where the fad is. However, there is no um, seabed lease signed on behalf of any fisher or any fisher folk organization for the marine space. So as a result, if you put a fad out there, you're putting it out at your own risk. And most of the times they do not give the, the coordinates for the fad. So it is difficult for us as um, the entity responsible for the management of the marine space to say um, how many fads are out there or who have ownership of those, these fads. So um, it is um, being done on an informal basis at this moment. And we, I know that there is a fad fishing group in place, however, that that group has not been um, active at the present moment, so um, we see all these user conflicts um, in place. However, we hope that as time goes by and as the, the fad fishers um, put more uh, effort into the, the management of the fishery, that we, um, these issues will be rectified. Okay, and Mr. Pemerton, you said about vessel registry being um, harmonized. Uh, what about the data? and the data collection? Uh, we are also working on that. Uh, recently there was a workshop uh, funded under, uh, well a series of workshops I must say, correction, funded under the protected areas system that uh, are the uh, conserving biodiversity project. However, that system cannot be as easily manipulated as a current system that is used by the Department of Marine Resources in St. Kitts. So there are plans ahead to sort of do some coordination between both departments so that we can have the method of collecting data and handling it standardized. So that is the way going forward. Right now the two systems are independent of each other but uh, data is being collected and and, and shared on the national level with the Department of Statistics. So that is the situation as it is now, but going forward we hope that we could have a better system in place, whereby what is being done in St. Kitts is the same as what is being done in, in Nevis, so that the, the data is uh, more, um, it, it, we have a more reliable source of data and the data reflects more of what is happening in the industry. All right, thank you. Um, I have one other question, but this is in relation to some issues that fishers have been um, echoing. Uh, one or two different landing sites, as you know, in Nevis are actually privately owned. So the access to the fish landing site isn't really owned by fishers. As a new, uh, newly named department, um, how do you see us assisting fishers to maintaining their access to these landing sites? Okay, just let me l l look back a little bit at what is being called the Nevis Physical Depl Development Plan, in which recently there has been a move to like do zoning, uh, some rezoning. This this project uh, had its Genesis so many years ago in terms of uh, deciding the, the best uses for different areas on Nevis. However, it was not quite completed and even if it was completed in some kind of way, you still had to have revision of the plans because things change as, uh, as time goes on. Now, the, the fact is, uh, if you look here at Jessops, this is not public property. That is true. And uh, the same thing will obtain when it comes to cotton ground. Uh, Mosquito Bay, uh, Jones Bay, as uh, Wally Beach, that area. Uh, well, the government owns a little bit of land there by the, by the, um, the what do you call it, the water taxi pier. But that is not really for fish landing as such. We have also the area in Newcastle. I think some of that is owned by the Land Development Corporation. So there is some a bit of um, ownership of the people of Nevis of that land in that case. In the case of uh, Long Hall, which is another landing site. Yeah, there's also an issue there in terms of ownership of the land. It's not publicly owned in Young Castle. It used to be government owned, but we understand that there's some kind of development to be, to be put in place in that area. So it means that uh, 
the fishermen will not have access to that land if that is the case. So that is something that we have, we have been looking at and trying to secure if there is movement of fishermen from one side to the other, we secure a site that is as good or better and I put this, um, facilities will be put in place so that you know, the fishermen will not experience hardship. We look at Charleston as well. Well, we have the waterfront, the docks, which are, of course, in government hands. But on the other side of Charleston, Gallows Bay area, near to the Bath Stream, that, uh, to my knowledge, is also not uh, government owned. And the odd, other landing sites, uh, you know, informal landing sites we have around the island, like around the Long Hall Bay area, maybe uh, Cotton, Ground. Cotton Ground. We have two sites at Cotton Ground. We are near to the uh, the Hamilton Beach, and then we have another one down closer to Nelson Spring Phase 1. We even have some people operate from the Seabridge area. You know, we have to probably start to formalize uh, land ownership structure in those areas so that the fishermen cannot be denied access to, to the landing sites, that they have enough area for parking, enough area for servicing their vessels, their engines, for um, storage, storage of um, fishing equipment, fishing gear, that kind of thing. So that is something that is being addressed in the newest draft of the Nevis Physical Development Plan and we hope that uh, whatever we would have spoken about in the meetings would come to fruition in that there will be ownership uh, given to the people of Nevis and to the fishermen in particular of those sites. All right, thank you Mr. Pemerton. Um, Mr. Director, do you have any final words? Well, to add to what uh, Mr. Pemberton uh, just said, um, fishers have been um, using these landing sites uh, for generations. And what we, what we, what we see as uh, fishing is something that um, used as a social safety net for both um, St. Kitts and Nevis. So what we have to do is to ensure that um, these persons are not um, disenfranchised by um, if some landing sites are, are private, but um, we can accommodate them elsewhere. Um, we should make our best efforts to, to do so because fishing, um, as you know, is also part of our food, uh, food security um, initiatives that we have here. And we've seen over um, the past decade that fish numbers have decreased, um, not because of overfishing, but also because of land-based sources of marine pollution and climate change. So um, we, we know that um, aquaculture is something that is being talked about, that aquaculture will replace uh, marine captured um, fisheries as, as a major fishery by 2050. I think 90% um, of our uh, fish um, protein will come from aquaculture at that point in time. So uh, we have to look at fisher folks who are there right now, look at their age, look at the persons who are entering the industry and see if we could um, put them put them in a, um, a sector, the same sector but in different areas of the sector to maximize um, their contribution to the economy of St. Kitts and Nevis. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pemerton, final words. Yeah, well, going forward, we would like to see an improvement in the fishing industry in terms of like fishing methods as well and in terms of the management of fisheries as well. Uh, well, Mark spoke to aquaculture, that could be one method in which we can sort of maybe decrease the, the fishing effort as regards the, the marine capture species. So that is something we can look at in terms of aquaculture on the island. The only bit we really have now is some, some sea moss farm, farming by the, by the uh, Indian Castle Fisher for group. And that is part of aquaculture uh, as well. It's not only fish we can you know, farm that uh, that's sea moss. We could maybe farm seaweed and you know, there are other things in, in terms of the marine environment that we can look at. But we can also have reserve areas. I know we have um, conservation areas in the management plan for the Narrows, for example, or even around the island of Nevis, we have different zones. So in terms of the zoning plan, do, plans those conservation areas we are hoping would allow for uh, our, that the fish, if you want to put it the way that some people put it, to come back, but that we have more fish in inshore areas, hopefully, if we have some kind of um, 
I don't want to say protection, but better management of the marine space, especially the near shore fisheries. In terms of the offshore fisheries as well, uh, well again, people even when they fish around the fast don't have to take all the fish. You have to, you could leave some of the smaller mahi, mahi, wahoo, or whatever type of fish, tuna example, you could catch, exercise some catch and release and leave these to go on and so they mature and reproduce and they restock the the ocean species and uh, the, the ocean pelagic species. So there's a need for things like that and we hope that uh, with the cooperation of the fishers of course who are the main stakeholders in this industry at least in terms of catching uh, with that we can have maybe a revitalization of the sector that we have we make more money out of it. We have, you know, we have closed seasons uh, and we respect the size limits and whatever else we need to do in order to make sure that we have a vibrant fishing industry. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pemerton. Thank you, Mr. Williams. It was quite enjoyable to have you here, especially as the first official guest on Sea Hunters. So I would like to say to the viewers, it was wonderful having you here with us as well and we'll catch you next time.